So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Plants for People, for Birds and People, um, an Audubon initiative to bring native plants home. So our presenter today is Kathy Wise. She is the um, Community Science Program Manager at Audubon Southwest. She's been with them for 13 years. She's a bird biologist and master gardener. And she also has been leading bird walks at BTA since their inception. So she has a lot of experience here in the garden with our uh, birds and our plants specifically, as well as throughout the Southwest. So I'll go ahead and let you take it away, Kathy. All right, thank you, Shelby. And thank you everyone for being here on this very hazy Saturday. Good heavens. Um, you are here likely because you love gardening and you love birds and you're looking at ways to um, attract more into your yard. Uh, so you've noticed on your screen, hopefully you are seeing a, um, a poll. Um, and I'd like you to just take a minute now, you can close your eyes, nobody's watching you, or maybe there are people watching you, but um, let them watch. Just close your eyes, take a minute, imagine your ideal backyard or porch or your ideal outdoor setting. What's that look like? What's it smell like? How does it feel? And then check the boxes um, and let's see uh, which ones are the most popular. You can check as many as you want. Um, other elements that would include kind of recreational things like a pool or a play, playground equipment, whatever, workout equipment. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But while you're doing the poll, while people are continuing to join, I just wanted to thank you again for being here today and let you know that um, I'm really happy and excited to do this presentation. So thank you for having me, Shelby. Um, and while you're answering the poll, I have a little video that I'm gonna share. Um, a lot of people, especially in the West, are not familiar with Audubon, more so in the East. We started in the East. Um, so for those of you who are not, this will give you a really quick introduction. And for those of you who are, I think you'll enjoy the video. It's pretty fun. So enjoy. If you're watching this video, there's a good chance you already know who we are. Need a hint? But we have the inkling of an idea that a lot of people don't really know what we do or why we exist. So we decided to take it to the streets to find out, what is Audubon? Autobahn Society? Audubon, 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 Audubon. I know, I know, I know you've got the Audubon ball rule. Is it something to do with the German highway? Sounds German. Someone who is in independent. Let me Google it. Do you know what the Audubon Society is? Yes, birds. That's right, person on the street. But let's start from the beginning. The National Audubon Society began its roots in 1896 when Harriet Hemingway and Mina Hall organized groups to convince Boston society ladies to stop wearing hats donned with real bird feathers. By 1898, state-level Audubon societies had been established in parts of the country. And in 1905, the National Audubon Society was founded, an environmental nonprofit dedicated to conserving birds and their habitats. And of course, our society is named in honor of the one and only John James Audubon, an ornithologist and naturalist who painted and cataloged the birds of North America in the 19th century. So that was a little history lesson, but you might be wondering, who is Audubon? More than 100 years later, Audubon is now a group of conservationists, storytellers, and advocates, many of whom work directly on lands around the country to preserve precious bird habitats an award-winning magazine in which we publish stories about birds and issues that affect them in the world we all share, an educator for the environmentalists of our future, a host for the annual Audubon Photography Awards, a contest that shows bird life at its most vivid, vulnerable, and elegant, a pioneer in research, for example, using science-backed climate models to predict how birds in the U.S. and Canada will react to climate change, an environmental organization with almost 500 local chapters. No, seriously, we have a lot of chapters. There's most likely an Audubon chapter, center, or sanctuary in your state if you don't know about it already. And yes, we're also a bunch of die-hard bird people. The National Audubon Society means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
But in the end, everything we do is to protect the birds and wildlife around us, their habitats, and the living, breathing planet we all call our home. What does Audubon mean to you? Okay, so hopefully you learned a little bit about Audubon. Um, and Shelby, unfortunately, I, I cannot see the poll results. Are they coming in or? Yep, I can click to end the poll now. Okay, so we'll have to check that out. Ah, here it is. Um, all right, so gosh, where to put you? Um, we'll talk about the poll in just a second. Just wanted to kind of wrap up Audubon um, and the fact that in July, Audubon Arizona and Audubon New Mexico joined forces. So we're now Audubon Southwest. If you're not a member of Audubon yet, well, what are you waiting for? Um, we have over 40,000 members, but we could use all the help we can get. Um, and this slide kind of shows you our 12 chapters where they're located. Um, we have about 25 people working for us and three facilities in both states. So that is that. All right, so let's see. Can I click through? I can. Here's the poll results. Um, water feature, colorful flowers, 84%. So colorful flowers and shade look like they're kind of neck and neck. And then the other elements, I'm interested in hearing what those are. Um, so please put them in the chat box if you can. Um, yeah, that's cool. So um, I think that it probably will not surprise you to know that those same things that you wanted are things that birds want and need. Um, so water feature, especially important here in the desert. Um, the colorful flowers, I bet I surprised you. You expected to see a hummingbird there. Um, just want to point out that those colorful flowers are beneficial to more birds than just hummingbirds. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a little bit. Shade. Shade provides nesting. It provides roosting. It provides a place for birds to escape predation. So having that shade, um, in most cases, people, when they're envisioning shade in the garden, it's going to be a plant or a large shrub. Sometimes it's uh, a man-made structure, but most of the time it's providing nesting, um, shelter for birds. Uh, all right, and then the food. Um, birds <laughs> may enjoy some of your food crops as well. Um, I just recommend be prepared for that. Plant enough to share if there's something that you really wanna keep birds away from, you know, erect some kind of a, a barrier so that they can't get at it. Um, and usually people can grow vegetables, fruit with birds. Um, and if anything, the birds are helping them with, with pests that could otherwise take the, the plants. Um, and then lastly, a safe space, right? So usually when we're talking about a safe space uh, for recreation, oftentimes it's a place where our kids can play or our dog can run and we wanna keep things in. For birds, when you have that safe space, it's more about what you're keeping out you know, the marauding cats or um, vehicles or whatever. Um, and the reason I wanted to get us all thinking about what we want versus what birds want is birds provide a really good lens. Now, I can almost guarantee none of you were envisioning this landscape. Um, I'm sharing this picture because nothing in this picture is native. Um, there's absolutely, well, I can't say no value, but very, very little wildlife value um, to a planting like this. So why are people doing it? Well, for the longest time, we've had this teeter-totter um, way over to the side of what looks good, what's going to look neat, what's going to provide a screen, what's going to be a, a focal point and an anchor. And we've gotten to the point where we really need to balance that out, right? So yes, you can still have something that's gonna look really nice and stay clean and be maintainable, but then you also have to think about food web. You have to think about watershed, um, all kinds of things. And having a more balanced view um, in mind is much better. And, and like I said, we're using birds as a focus, as a lens, 
Because if you take care of birds, you take care of most of the big problems in the world. Where birds thrive, people prosper. That's true. And so what we need to do is really be mindful of, wow, now we're all over the place, right? Um, and birds are really having to adjust to a very, very new landscape. So for centuries, birds have been enjoying these vast landscapes of native plants and an intact ecosystem that provides everything that they need. Um, and over time, what we've done as people, is we've chopped those habitats up into little tiny pieces um, and removed the native vegetation and planted things that we want that are gonna be neater looking or whatever. Um, and now over 50% of the US is considered suburban or urban or urban matrix. Um, and the plants in those areas are typically over 80% non-native. So you look down at this landscape and you think, oh, this doesn't look so bad. If I was a bird, I could make it. Um, it could be a lot worse. Well, the landscaping is just part of the problem. You have to keep in mind that there's other factors that are highly influencing bird populations throughout, well, for in, in the West, it's water, but throughout our, our country, throughout North America, and actually throughout the world. So these are very, very real challenges that birds are facing, not just in our cities, but outside of our cities um, in the more wild areas that they're using. So I'm talking about climate change, I'm talking about drought, um, fire right now is a big one. Um, so it's become increasingly important that we start thinking very um, intentionally about birds and how we can help them. A friend of mine pointed out the other day you know, they're gonna turn off water to the cities last. Like if we ran out of water, they're gonna keep the people going. And I was like, wow, that's kind of scary, but also another impetus for, wow, it really does make a, a difference what we're planting in our cities. Hopefully it'll never come to that, but anyway. Um, for plant food groups for birds, if we were in person, I would make you answer this. Um, berries and fruits, nuts and seeds, nectar, those are all pretty obvious, but there's a fourth one that goes overlooked, um, and I, I'm straining my ears to hear you. I'm sure you're all shouting it out. It's insects, and people are typically very surprised to learn that almost 100% of land birds feed insects to their chicks. Um, caterpillars are a big favorite. And even birds that you don't think are feeding or eating insects, like your sweet little hummingbirds, other vegetarians, they're not. They're going after little spiders and gnats and they need that. They need the protein, um, they need the vitamins. Now, especially caterpillars. And this is like the proverbial picture of, you know, you think mother bird with at nest and it, what does she have? Usually caterpillars, some soft worm, big juicy thing, shoving it down their little mouth. And it's because these are soft and large. It's a great bang for the buck, high in protein, high in fat, low amount of chitin, which is that hard stuff that makes the beetles, you know, um, tough, and lots of carotenoids. So we know carotenoids are really good for us. Um, and they're also very good for birds for a lot of reasons. So native plants provide a wide array of insect life um, and they are better for birds. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, on the left hand side of this slide you're seeing an oak. Now this is a native oak. Um, I believe this is an eastern species but oaks are universally very rich in insect life. An oak can support over 300 species of caterpillars, just caterpillars. Um, and remember, caterpillars are a life stage, um, typically, in some insect that's going to help us pollinate. So they're pretty important for a lot of reasons. Versus this native oak versus the ginkgo, which many of you may know, it's a lovely tree. It comes from China, though. Um, and it's only able to support five species of caterpillars. Uh, and what's worse is it's labeled as pest-free. After this presentation, I hope that every one of you, when you see something that says pest-free, run the other way. Because what that means is it's really gonna be devoid of value 
for birds and wildlife. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, because people will, will say, well, why can't they, why can't those bugs just eat whatever they have? Well, evolution has happened over a very long period of time. Will these insects start using different plants as that's all they have? Maybe some of them will die out, but some of them may be able to evolve, but not anytime soon. We, we can't wait around for that. So instead, just recognize that insects are specialists. And one of the best known examples is going to be the monarch caterpillar. Um, the monarch butterfly only lays eggs on milkweed. So planting milkweed has become a very, very important job for us to do. Um, at Audubon, we typically have two plant sales a year. I know Boyce Thompson also has those. Um, and we sell milkweed. And I had a lady come up to me and she said, you know, I've been buying these milkweed plants and I don't have any monarchs. I don't have any butterflies. And I'm like, huh, that's kind of weird. And she goes, yeah, the only thing I have are these weird like worms, like caterpillars. And so I just take them off and smash them. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, so I had to go home to my son and I said, hey, where do butterflies come from? And he goes, from caterpillars. I'm like, okay, good. So school is still teaching that. Um, and it's also a bigger lesson for you like even if you saw that caterpillar, which I think is really cool looking, um, you may see other larval forms of insects and just be like, ugh, what is this thing? Um, and I encourage you to look it up. There's all kinds of resources now. So look up those weird things um, and see what they become because um, sometimes it's really pretty cool, pretty cool metamorphosis. Um, and just so you know, monarchs are in pretty serious decline. I think 90% of our monarchs are gone, um, but there's still hope, you know, get out there, plant some milkweed, and remember that a world without insects is a world without birds. Here's that picture I was talking about. The mom with those, what are they? Oh, they look like little caterpillars, and she's feeding her young, or he. But remember, those caterpillars had to come from somewhere. Um, unfortunately, the bird can't just like go to the store and get a pack of them. They are, the birds are relying on plants. Um, that's the foundation. So here we are at the nest looking down this little, it just looks like a piece of bubble gum. It's just this pink little wad. It's kind of amazing that there's any adult birds at all, right? I mean, they look so helpless and they are, they are helpless. <clears throat> Many songbirds, especially our migratory birds, uh, lay relatively small eggs. Um, their babies are al altricial, which means that they do most of their development outside of the egg. <clears throat> so when they hatch, they're like this, naked, blind, needing a lot of protein, a lot of food, um, versus a, ch a chicken, which is precocial. Um, and most of the development of the chicken, or birds like a chicken, develop in the eggs. So they hatch out and they're running around and um, they're a lot more independent. So anyway, Thinking back to these little pink gumball things that are so helpless, these are chickadee babies. They could be anything, right? Um, but they eat over 400 caterpillars a day. Um, they need that 9,000 little caterpillars until they fledge. So that's a significant amount of insect material. And people, when I give this presentation, are often like kind of taken aback and they're like, oh, I really don't want my garden to be overtaken with these pests. Well, or quote pests, if you st stand back and like let nature do its thing, you're not, there's a balance there and a very important balance. And you'll start seeing birds come in and kind of take care of your problem, which is really, really cool. <sighs> All right, I gotta take a drink of water. I wish that I could take questions, but we're holding them until the end. And hopefully at this point, you're like, yes, okay, I'm, I'm down with this. Um, and you might be thinking, how can I find out what plants are native to my area? What birds can I attract? Can I plant intentionally to get a specific bird? Yes, you can. And then how can I get local support? I'm so glad you asked these questions. National Audubon has developed a really handy tool. It's called the Plants for Birds uh, Native Plant Database. And you can just Google Audubon native plants and you're going to get to this page, Plants for Birds, um, and you're going to get to this 
uh, landing page for the database. And all you need to do is put in your email address, your zip code, and search. And what you're going to come up with is this, this page, which has a number of tabs. The first one is best results. So that's going to be um, plants that are going to be the best for your zip code, also ones that are easiest to find. So there's a couple filters there. Um, then there's full results. You see there's a lot more of those. Many of those plants are at this time difficult to get. Doesn't mean they're impossible. Then you're going to have local resources and next steps. So you've got a lot to digest here. Um, looking into the best results, notice that there's this means to search. So you can search on all types of plants. It can be trees, it can be shrubs, it can be flowers, it can be a number of things. What plant resources? If you don't care what type of plant and you know you just want seeds or nuts or whatever, you can indicate that. And then you can also be very specific about what type of bird you want to attract. Um, and notice here, this is just a general search, but the first thing on the list, this um, Sacaton grass, um, it shows the birds that are attracted to it. it, gives me a little information about the plant. You can check, add to your plant list, um, and you can go through this as long as you want and have this list running, which then Audubon will email to you, which makes it handy. You can just get it on your phone, take it to the nursery. Um, we also have an option where you can buy now. So some of these plants are available online and you can just have them mailed, which is especially helpful right now um, with the pandemic. <clears throat> that said, I think it is much preferable to go to Boyce Thompson Arboretum, get your plants there. Um, get them close to home because those plants have been grown in our environment. They are going to be sturdier, um, more used to our bright sun and high temperatures and big temperature fluctuations. So anyway, buy local um, if you can, and you will see under resources that there's a list of places to buy based on my, my email, or I'm sorry, on my zip code. Okay, so how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Um, a word about maintenance. So this is a rock. This is the only thing in your garden that isn't gonna take maintenance. I hate to break it to you. There's definitely a spectrum. Um, so for example, if you want beautiful roses in the Phoenix metro area, you're gonna earn them. You're gonna have to maintain that plant, be pretty diligent about it, watch over it. Um, on the other end is a Zen garden. Like if you don't want to do anything in the garden, make a Zen garden, like have it be rocks, have it be sculptural. Um, but even native plants are going to require your attention. They're going to require your care. And I just, I don't want to go into it. You know, people will say, what's the thing I can put in that requires the least amount of care. And it's, it's just so, I mean, that's a personal decision. Um, judgment on what, what's a lot of care. This is no care. Um, everything else that we talk about, even if it's low, low maintenance, low water use, really important, but everything is going to require some attention, some care. All right, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about was balance. Um, so this is a corner of my backyard. Don't judge me too harshly because you'll see not everything back here is native. Um, I love growing cut flowers. I love growing vegetables. There's basil, there's tomatoes, but then also tucked in there are natives. And my point is that to help birds, you don't have to wipe out your entire landscape. Instead, you can think of it like, like healthy eating, right? So what's the suggested ratio? I think it's like 75% good food, 25% bad. So yeah, most of the time you eat a healthy diet once, once in a while you have a pizza, you have nachos, you drink some beer, um, and that's good. That's part of life. So what you really want is a space that you are going to love, that you are going to want to spend time in, um, that's going to draw you out, not something that's going to aggravate you. Um, and there's a saying with native plants, two years to strive, third year they thrive. And that's, that's kind of true. With many of the native plants, it takes time for them to establish and you have to be patient. Um, and in the meantime, like kind of put up with less than perfect optics, if you will. Um, and so that, that's a lot easier to do if you are balancing 
your um, garden diet, if you will. So kind of in keeping with that diet theme, um, some of you are probably familiar with the eat this, not that recipe book. And so I, I did just kind of a short little thing on plant this, not that. It's kind of like eat this bagel instead of eating the donut or whatever. Um, but these are better choices for birds. So one of the biggest, uh, highly, well, I don't even know how you'd say it. Most commonly, that's it. Most commonly used hedge in the Phoenix Valley or much of the West is oleander. Um, do you guys know where that comes from? It comes from Africa. So that's a long ways away. Um, it's poisonous. It is not a good plant um, for birds or for wildlife or for young children either. Um, but we like it because it takes a lot of abuse. It's not a stone. You still have to trim it. There's things that you have to do for it, but it can take our heat. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty established here. And believe me, I'm not on a campaign to like get rid of all the oleander. I mean, it would be better if there was something else planted, but where we can, maybe we can start making better choices for birds, for wildlife, for us. Um, one really hard sell is the saltbush family. They are um, native, of course. They are grayish green. They take a lot of abuse. They are not a showy. So that's one thing that people don't like. Like, okay, yeah, it'll form this big hedge. It'll give me that screen so I don't have to see my neighbors. But I don't really like it. Um, I don't like the way it looks. So I, I hear that and I'm giving you a cheat. So here's a cheat. Don't tell anybody I, <laughs> well, you can tell. You can tell them I don't care. This is Texas sage. Um, Texas sage is native to Texas. So that's a lot closer than Africa. Um, I think people love it. It's a very popular landscaping plant here in the valley and elsewhere, all throughout the West. Um, because it is really tolerant, you can trim it. You know, people like to get the oleander into a nice mound. And do the same thing with Texas sage. Probably don't want to go too hard on the pruning because um, it's not good for the plant. But you can gently curve it, shape it. Um, bees love it. I mean, all kinds of native insects love it. So I don't feel bad about it. I feel okay with it. Um, and while we're on kind of the hedges are more like the big, you want to form like kind of a natural wall. These are shrubs. So with bougainvillea, um, again, it's very popular and for good reason. It provides color. It's easy to care for. It's also thorny as hell. So if you have a bougainvillea in your yard and you're doing your own yard maintenance, I can't, I mean, you're, you're going to learn to not like this plant as much because gosh, those thorns are wicked. Um, there is a place for thorns in the garden. If you want that protection, that added protection to keep unwanted visitors out of your yard, bougainvillea is a good choice. A better choice, oh, and bougainvillea is from the Mediterranean. So across the big pond, that's a long ways away. Desert hackberry, native plant, um, has thorns, so you can use it for that protection. And this is a darling plant for birds. They'll nest in it. Um, in the springtime, it has little tiny flowers that are attractive to butterflies. So you'll have those. Um, and then there's these little orange uh, fruit. They're kind of tart, kind of tangy. Um, and the birds love these. And so you'll have these fruit um, persist on the plant if birds don't come um, into the late fall and winter. So you, that provides you with some color in the garden, um, which I think is great. I love desert hackberry. I'm a big fan. All right, so vines. Cat claw vine. Here's another one you see everywhere. Where's it from? West Indies. Okay, West Indies and also like Eastern Mexico. Um, so it's a long way from home. It'll tear your house apart. Like it's very aggressive. Um, it grows quickly, doesn't require a lot of water. Um, it can become invasive. So if you have it, you, that's, that becomes a maintenance issue because it's, like I said, it's just gonna take your house over um, some people like that look, but it is not as good as 
something like Queen's Wreath, which is native to the Sonoran Desert. Um, bees love it, hummingbirds love it. Um, it's a beautiful plant uh, and a really much better choice than cat claw vine. All right, so cheating. So these are things that are like, um, like oven baked potato chips. Like it's better for you to eat vegetables. Like it would be better for you to plant a native plant. These plants, Lantana and Mexican Bird of Paradise are both native to Sonora. So that's pretty close to us. Um, Lantana I have in my yard and I really like it because hummingbirds use it, butterflies use it, um, and then after the flowers are done, uh, this plant produces like a little fruit. It almost looks like a blackberry and the mockingbirds adore that. So it is providing some pretty important services to the birds. Uh, also, it blooms. It's blooming right now. What else is? <laughs> um, I'll tell you what else is Mexican bird of paradise. So these two are going to be like your late summer mainstays. Um, both of them provide some value. So Mexican bird of paradise, hummingbirds love. Um, the Mexican bird of paradise, it stays green all year. So you can trim off those dead flowers, form it into a mound. Lantana is also a very forgiving plant. You can form that the way you want. Um, so both of these, I think, are, are good choices. Um, and, you know, regardless of what you choose, when you bring it home, there's some definite do's and don'ts. Um, so let's start with the don't. Do not ever yard a plant out of the pot by its stem. Plants have lots of leaves, they have lots of roots. Typically, they will have one stem. And if you damage the stem, you're going to kill the plant. So try not to do this. Um, if you have trouble getting a plant out of the pot, the best thing to do is just kind of um, you want to just slide it out, supporting the stem, being very gentle. Um, if it's not coming out, go ahead and put it on the ground, roll it with your hands, roll it with your feet. Sometimes you'll notice that at the bottom of the pot, the roots have grown out and are kind of keeping the plants in. Go ahead and just cut those off. Um, and when you do finally slide the plant out of the pot, um, oftentimes you're going to see a, a mass of roots. You're going to want to kind of feather those out a little bit. Don't just plunk them plunk that into the ground. You really don't want your plant, plant roots to continue like grow, growing in a circle as if it was contained. Instead, just go ahead and, and feather those out a little bit. Um, and go ahead and put the, put the plant in the ground. And just a, a couple words about how to put it in the ground. Um, you really don't want to bury too much of the plant underground unless you're planting tomatoes. So tomatoes like being planted deep like this, like this first example. This native plant is very unhappy. You can see that. Don't, don't do this. Um, also, more common is to not dig a deep, deep enough hole because the ground is so hard. And you're like, oh my God, I'll never finish this. This has got to be good enough. You plunk the plant down and then just mound soil up around it. Looks like a little volcano when you're done. And that's no good. No bueno. Um, what happens with that volcano shape, um, the roots of the plant heat up faster than if they were actually in the ground. Um, and so they can, they can heat up, they can dry out, uh, pests can get in more easily. It's just a bad, bad thing. Just take the extra effort, um, eat an extra bowl of Wheaties, get that hole to be the same, the same height as the plant that makes any sense. Um, so that's what you're shooting for. I also wanted to introduce some common, I almost said common criminals, they're not criminals, common visitors to the garden. Um, these are four birds that you're likely to see um, when you start providing some native plants. <clears throat> these are very, very easy to attract. So first of all, we have the verdant. This is a tiny bird, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Some people think they mistake them for hummingbirds because they are so wee. Um, and there is a Native American story about how the Great Spirit reached down and grabbed a verdon by the wings um, and kind of left those marks on its wings, those epaulets, um, and ki kissed him. And that's why he has the yellow head. I, th I always thought that that was a really sweet story. Um, anyway, next we have the house finch. 
Um, these have a beautiful song. Um, they're a fun little bird, usually in groups. The Abert's Toey um, is a very interesting bird. It has a limited range. It's only found in Arizona, New Mexico, and part of Texas. So, I mean, this is its home in the whole world. I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, you, you could attract them to your yard. Um, and then lastly, the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are probably the easiest thing to attract. Here in the, the Phoenix Valley, we have three species that we commonly see. Anna's hummingbirds are the most common. Um, there's also black-chinned and costas. And if you're calling in from Tucson, used to be that the black-chinned were more common down there. I think now Anna's and black-chinned are kind of neck and neck. Um, but anyway, we're, we're really lucky to have so many species of, of hummingbirds that we can see and enjoy here. And these birds, even though they are so common, are under threat. And I think you guys kind of got that from the very beginning of this presentation. Um, but one thing I wanted to make you aware of was a new report that Audubon did called Survival by Degrees. It came out in 2019. Um, Oh, almost 400 species in North America are, are at risk because um, the, their habitats are changing, the climate is changing and things are shifting. Um, and this is a tool that you can look at when you have time if you're interested, um, climate.audubon.org, easy to navigate to. You can actually look up birds, specific birds, and see models that have been developed by Audubon scientists you can look at different years. You can see where the bird was in 2000, where it is in 2020, 2050, and then 2080. So it's, it's pretty eye-opening. Um, and what I really like about this report is that it ends with hope. Like it is not just like, oh yeah, it's, it's hopeless. We're, this is, we're done, just throw in the towel. No, instead this, this data provides us with information that will allow us to um, proactively plant in areas and um, really be kind of ahead of the game. So I really like that and I, I recommend you looking at it. Um, and I really hope that this presentation has left you hungry for more, right? Um, and so I wanted to share with you some upcoming events. Um, Hopefully some of you are our Audubon friends and you know that our center in South Phoenix has been closed since March. It's still closed. Um, we do not have a reopening date at this time. We're keeping an eye on community spread and um, a couple other factors that need to be in the green before we're going to open our doors again. Um, we started doing our very popular birds and beer uh, third Thursday monthly Kind of lecture and beer drinking time. Um, we started doing them as webinars. I believe there's going to be a webinar in October. There isn't one this month. Um, and then in person in 2021, we're certainly hoping so. Um, but what makes one of the things that makes this event so popular is that we have partnered with 13 different brewers throughout um, the West, throughout Arizona, New Mexico, and also Colorado. Um, to support this effort. They're called the Western Brewers Council. And one of those members, Arizona Wilderness, has, has helped us with birds and beer. So they provide the beer, um, we're able to sell it and to um, raise money for our programming. So it's fun. Um, each month we have a different speaker. Uh, and so you can learn new stuff. And our webinars were actually quite popular. We were surprised. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to meet again in person. Conservation Work Days used to be the third Saturday of each month. We are planning on hosting in November. Um, and we do, we have a partnership with Wild at Heart. We're doing burrowing owl relocation. So we're gonna be focused on that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to share was grow at home. So given the pandemic and the fact that so many of our volunteers are just stuck at home, um, we started a program, just piloted it, we weren't sure how it would go, where you could sign up and get a kit in the mail. Um, this fall, we're focused on sunflowers. We made 50 kits. You get this kit in the mail, you grow 10 sunflowers, we're letting you keep five. Five you give to us. Um, you can just drop them off at the center in October. We're going to set all that up. Um, and all 50 kits were gone in like 24 hours. So if you 
go to Audubon, Arizona and you look at Grow at Home, there is a link and you can sign up but you'll be put on the spring cohort. So please, if that sounds like something you would be interested in doing, please go, go for it um, because we're really excited. I think that there's a lot of opportunities for that. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. And I know that several of you reached out to Shelby before this presentation um, and you had questions and I wanted them to be saved. So I just wanted to See what questions we have. Okay, so one question is, are all sunflowers good for native birds? Um, and yes, they, they are. Um, there are many cultivars, as you're aware. So, so there are native sunflowers, native to Arizona. Um, they tend to be a little bit smaller than the ones you see like at the florist, but um, yeah, birds, especially lesser goldfinches, the house finch that you saw, absolutely, um, absolutely love the sunflowers. Any other questions? I put two questions in the chat that came through on our Facebook live stream, if you want to check out those, Kathy. Okay. All right, so... I've stopped sharing. I guess I don't have, didn't have to do that, but I wanted to see what was going on in the rest of the world. Um, okay, so from Facebook, thanks for this. Is there also a site on Audubon where you can look up the number of each species of birds in your area by zip code by year from the Christmas count? Wow, um, that information is really difficult to get. Um, I mean, it's difficult to estimate. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Christmas bird count, um, that count has been going on uh, for 200 years, so a long time. Um, 200, 100, a long time, anyway. Um, and it is one day, a one day count um, between December, 14th and January 5th. So it's in the winter time. So we're missing a lot of the, um, our migrants, the ones, the birds that just come here to breed and then go back to Mexico or wherever they're going. Um, so it's a really good kind of snapshot in time of those birds. However, you would be missing, and you can look that up, not by zip code, it would be by, by count circle, and the count circles are 15, um, 15 miles diameter. Um, you can look up the count circle, you can get reports that way, but just recognize that that's only winter birds. That's not going to be everything. Um, so just keep that in mind. I hope that helped. Um, but you can definitely get those resources through just Google Audubon Christmas bird count data and you'll be able to, to hunt and peck away. Heart's content. All right, um, so another question from Facebook. I live in Northern California zone 10A and have been trying to grow Mexican bird of paradise for four years. Bought it in Phoenix. It hardly grows and never flowers. I've tried it in various locations. What are the best conditions for this plant that I love so much? Well, bless your heart. Gosh, I, that, I can't get rid of mine. Mine is just going great guns. It must thrive on really high heat. Um, so I'm not sure. I think maybe Northern California and gosh, I hope you're safe from the fires. It's just terrible up there. Um, it's probably too cold, honestly. Um, I would bring it in if it's small enough, like kind of bring it in to a, an enclosed area if you had a patio or something like that and just see how it does. Um, but that's a really good question. I just suspect it's too cold. All right, where do you buy native sunflower seeds? One good source for them is going to be um, Native Seed Search, which is out of Tucson. Um, and they have a very nice online uh, portal for buying stuff. Um, so they're good. I've also seen, um, 
I've seen the seeds at a couple different nurseries, kind of higher end nurseries. Um, so just keep an eye out for, uh, for the native, native variety. Um, and then another question is, are there different species of milkweed that grow better in different locations? Absolutely. Um, I was surprised to learn that Arizona has, I think, 13 different species of milkweed. And um, here in the Phoenix area, Tucson area, um, rush milkweed or the desert milkweed grow, seems to do the best. But Arizona milkweed is another option here. Um, as you go to northern parts of the state, there's a sand milkweed. Um, and then in different parts of the country, oh my gosh, um, there's just so many different varieties. And there is an organization, I believe they're called Monarch Watch, and they are a really good resource. So if you're looking for um, different kinds of milkweed, ones that are gonna grow well in your area, if you're not from Arizona, um, that's a really good resource. All right, and then this is a fun question. Do birds have a sense of smell? Are they attracted to any fra fragrant plants? Um, birds have a very poorly developed sense of smell with the exception of turkey vultures. Turkey vultures find their food, their rotting flesh food by smell. Um, and when you look at a turkey vulture, you'll even see it has very large nares, those big holes. Um, other birds though, their sense of smell is not very well developed. And so no, they're not gonna be attracted by um, by smell. They're gonna be attracted by color. Um, birds do have very excellent eyesight, you probably realize that, um, and by insects that are drawn to the flowers. So, so yeah, you might kind of indirectly attract birds by planting something that's gonna smell good to bugs, certain insects, and then the birds are gonna come in. So I hope that helps. Um, are there books you recommend on what plants, in addition to what you have mentioned, that are good plants, that regarding good plant, bird plants as well as water and climate friendly to both the plants and the environment? That is um, a great question and there are so many books. Um, so I would love to follow up with you um, and just provide a list. Um, I can't do that really right here, but um, I bet that Shelby, you probably also have some resources as well. So um, my email address is my first name, Kathy with a C, dot wise, W-I-S-E, like an owl, at audubon.org. So um, if you wouldn't, if you have a question like that and you kind of need a list or something like that, or you want to follow up with me afterwards, I would be really happy to help you. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm sharing my screen again. Hopefully I'll get rid of these questions and answers. Um, just so I can say thank you, unless there are any more questions. I'm happy to help, I'm happy to stick around. Um, Kathy, there's yeah. a few more questions. If you open the Q&A feature, there's questions there for you. Oh gosh, okay. Um, oh, all right. Um, are there Hummer plants that are good in shade? Yes, yes there are. Um, I found that a lot of our penstemon, um, and there's a variety of them, regardless of where you, where you are in the state or in the southwest, here in the valley or in Tucson, they tend to do a lot better in the shade, at least partial shade. Um, now deep, deep shade, that's a little bit tougher. Um, I know that Chuparosa, will do, will tolerate some shade, tends to do well. Um, so it just really depends on your conditions and then, you know, what type of shade. Is it morning shade? Is it afternoon? And I would just recommend, oh, okay, um, Shelby, I think, has an answer. Oh, no, I was just clicking it. To... Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe, well, I mean, Shelby, please, you're the plant person, so um, feel free to insert any, any additional information as you feel, um, as you feel like it. Um, and I do have a question for you, Shelby. When is the Boyce Thompson um, plant sale? Is that in October? 
Yes, so it'll be um, October 9th that Friday will be our members only day and then it'll go through the 18th, I believe. So the 9th through the 18th. Perfect, that's awesome. Okay, I'll be there. And I'm also going to be kicking off the um, Boyce Thompson Arboretum Bird Walk series on October 3rd. Um, so hopefully if you guys are interested, you wanna chat in person, um, sign up and I'll see you then. Uh, our next question is, are cardinals native and what attracts them? So cardinals are native. It's very surprising to people. Um, but yes, they are native and they like things that are going to be, um, you know, like uh, provide berries or nuts. So the desert hackberry that we learned about earlier, <clears throat> that's a really good one. Um, I have not had cardinals in my yard. Um, I'm in North Phoenix and I have not ever seen them here. They tend to like more space. Um, so unless you have like a big property, I think it might be a little bit difficult. Um, they like water, you know, if you can provide a water feature. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. And then what plants can you plant to attract Averts Toei specifically? So that's also a really good question because Abert's towies like to forage on the ground. Um, so they're going to like having shrubs they can get underneath. And most of what they're going to be doing is eating insects. So attracting the Abert's towies happens more as like a side effect of not using any insecticides um, and providing some leaf litter. Uh, and we didn't talk about that. Um, but providing, leaving that, leafing that uh, plant material that falls, you know, off the shrubs, whatever, just leaving some of that um, is typically like a really good thing. Um, but yeah, they, the Abrams toys really like to forage in the ground. So um, I guess if you, if you had to, I don't know, people don't like this, but you, they would come if you, um, bought those dried mealworms. But that's not a plant. So plant something, let it, let the leaves fall, let nature do its thing, um, and the Abert's toes will come around. Um, what bird eats hornworms? So that's a really good question. Hornworms actually become luna moths. Um, so, uh, or sphinx moths, I'm sorry, not luna moths. Sphinx moths, which a lot of things will eat. Um, in the moth form. So our little owls, like western screech owls, love those. Elf owls love them. Um, yeah, I guess a couple other of the small owls. The hornworms, um, I think in the presentation we did see a kestrel actually feeding a horned worm to its baby. Um, so all those are birds of prey. I have not observed another bird eating horned worms, but I don't have that many. Um, I would think that things like a curved-billed thrasher might, um, but yeah, they do they do get eaten. <clears throat> I think they're really cool, um, but I know a lot of people don't like them because they'll eat all your <laughs> all your tomatoes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then our last question, it looks like, is is this the right time to plant good bird plants, or should I wait until spring? That is an excellent question. Thank you for bringing that up. Fall here in the desert is the best time to plant. And I would say, you know, September's tricky because it's kind of like, I think February back East, people start thinking, oh, the winter's over. And then you get this big blizzard and September can be like that for us. Like, oh, finally it's cooling off and then we'll have a baking day. But towards the end of the month, it gets safer. October is perfect. That's why Boyce Thompson's sale is so well-timed because you can head out there um, it gives the plants a more, I guess, conducive temperature to grow and establish before the winter comes. Um, and then over the winter, they get the winter rains, hopefully, knock on wood. Um, and they're really established before we, we hit the, the, the heat. So I think, honestly, October, um, November is the best time, is better, even better than the spring. So good question. All right, so what was that? 
Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Kathy, for sharing this presentation with us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. Was there one more? Oh, yeah, it was my pleasure, but I'll answer this last question before I, I sign off. Um, Desert Willow, is it a native tree to Arizona? It is. Um, and yes, yeah, so this participant lists a bunch of birds in her yard that like it. Um, yeah, I, I love desert willow and it is probably the best desert tree to plant in a suburban landscape. All of the desert trees are fantastic for birds, but they can present big challenges for homeowners because they, um, if they're getting water, they tend to grow really big. Um, they will need to be trimmed back, they will need to be pruned. Desert willow is beautiful. Um, it's very interesting, it has gorgeous flowers. Um, it's, it, it will take some pruning so you can shape it the way you want. And what I really like about it, and some people don't, is it's deciduous, which means, you know, like many of our other plants keep their leaves all year, desert willow loses its leaves. So you have a different look in the garden, you have a different view. All of a sudden you can see through it. And in the spring, it's really exciting to see that green growth again. You know, it's just like, ah, oh, spring is here and it leaves out. Um, yeah, so desert willow is native. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Kathy. We really do appreciate you taking the time to share this information with us and all of our guests here today. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, we appreciate your support of all of our programs virtually and um, throughout the summer. Keep an eye on our different e-news, our Facebook, um, our website for announcements of in-person events this fall. We are implementing um, some in-person tours and walks like Kathy mentioned, such as bird walks, et cetera, um, all with um, limited capacity um, to ensure social distancing and safety in that aspect. We are requiring masks for those as well, just to ensure the safety of our guests and the safety of our guides. So go ahead and take a look at those. We do have some changes just with pre-registration for tours, things like that that are a little different from the past. So if you have joined us before, make sure to take a look at some new ways we're doing things just to make sure everyone stays safe this season. So thank you again for your support and we hope to see you in the garden soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.